Hi everyone, I'm here with Daniel C, who has written a great book called Space Maker, How to Unplug, Unwind and Think Clearly in the Digital Age. Uh, welcome to uh, the stephenmcalpine.com blog, uh, vlog at the moment. Uh, Daniel, that's a big claim that you could unplug, unwind and think clearly in the digital age. Have we gone too far? Is there a way back? Yeah, look, I think we possibly have gone too far. And uh, so look, my background is I'm a pastor, but I'm also a productivity coach in a business. And yeah, I work with a lot of leaders in different places. And I've definitely seen that for a lot of us, we've shifted a little bit too far uh, into what I'd say is digital overuse, where having more tech, having more apps, even having more skills isn't necessarily the way to solve the problems we're experiencing. But it might be that we need less of it, at least from time to time. And what are the symptoms you've seen of those things happening? So obviously you're, you're Christian, you're working, but you're crossing both. Is there a commonality between what secular uh, problems are happening and what's happening in churches? Because I think pastors are pretty much hooked into the digital, <laughs> digital thing as well. Well, yeah, we all, look, we all are. We all are. I mean, I started with the iGen research from Jean Twenge. So that's, uh, she's a US population researcher and looked at the younger generation coming through and how it's shaped their mental health, their anxiety, it's changing their behaviours. Uh, but then I started reading that and I thought, actually, I'm not seeing stuff that's very different <laughs> in myself <laughs> and also in leaders that I'm working with. So the, the symptoms would be you, know, you feel distracted regularly. You find it hard to just be in silence or to read a normal book. Uh, you know, if you're on the loo or if you've got a foot, you know, a minute or you're at the bus stop or I don't know, you've just got these small pauses. You would generally be gravitated to pull out your phone or a, a tablet and go to your favorite app, whether that be the news or, you know, Instagram. Uh, and I suppose just that sense where people are feeling like they're always busy, they're always rushed. It's just not the stillness in their soul. Um, mm -hmm. And I even hear it. I talk to executives particularly, and even on the phone, they just, they just talk faster. And you have this sense that their brain is getting a little bit multitasky. Mm -hmm. uh, and rather than just being that, I suppose, non-anxious presence. And, and I think there's a connection with how much we're using tech and our ability to rest and be still. Yeah, so the idea of Space Maker, so you've got um, a nice big sort of space in the front cover of the book. Uh, if you're filling every bit of your day in, what, what is the cost to us of not having space specifically? Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a fascinating study by a guy called Timothy Wilson from the University of Virginia, and he interviewed 800 volunteers, and he just put him in a room for six to 15 minutes in a number of studies and said, what's it like to just sit and think your own thoughts with nothing else to do? No technology, nothing. And the majority of those people said they found it an uncomfortable experience. Some found it really uncomfortable. Now, this is a US study. So we tried lots of different scenarios, even at home in a lounge room in their own environment, they found it uncomfortable to be silent for 15 minutes. Uh, and then the best part of the study is he, he put electric, um, like he, he started to basically zap people with electricity before they went in. And it was so painful that they would pay $5 not to be shocked again. Uh, <laughs> And he put him in the room with nothing except for their own thoughts and this kind of zapping machine and said, I don't want you to zap yourself, but you can if you really want to. And I think like 60 to 70% of guys and like nearly 30% of uh, women chose to shock themselves with painful electricity rather than just sit in silence with their own thoughts. And I think that is a remarkable indication of what we're doing to ourselves in a society where that, we can't stop. They needed that sense of stimulation. To they needed a stimulation. That just, and, and as we know, if, if we don't listen to our own thoughts, if we don't listen to the spirit of God or pay attention to our soul in silence from time to time, mm -hmm. the stuff that, is shout, that wants to shout at us uh, starts to pop up. And so it, it is actually painful to hear mm -hmm. what your soul is saying to you if you never stop and you suddenly stop for 15 minutes. Yeah, that, that, that terrible silence. I love the chapter here uh, where it starts talking about the love where you met someone sitting on a on a bench and I think it was beautiful she yeah. was gorgeous <laughs> and her name was uh apple and she answered to the voice name of siri <laughs> and so the idea of love i mean this is interesting that um you think of augustine and the idea of desire and love and then what it means to worship and give yourself to something and you quote psalm 115 in a book i think that's for it's got wisdom from the bible for the world where you go, our God is in heaven, he does whatever pleases him. 
that their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. And we all go, of course, their idols were like that. And then you add your own little take on that. Our idols are lithium cobalt glass made by human hands. We have cameras but cannot see, Siri but cannot speak. We have touch screens but cannot feel, 5G mobility but cannot walk. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. Those last two lines, those who make them will be like them, and mm -hmm. so will all who trust in them. So we shape our technology and then it shapes us. Absolutely, yeah. The premise of the you know, beginning of the book is about shaping our paradigm. And as you mentioned, it's not a religious book. Uh, that was probably the most kind of spiritual or biblical chapter that I had. And I took a punt at that, trying to convince people that actually whether or not they believe in a God, we worship something or someone and the functional idols of our heart, which is Tim Keller's term, mm. uh, is an indication of, of our habits and vice versa. And I've been amazed at how many you know, people who would call themselves atheists have said, wow, I, I read that Targum, that, that mm. Psalm, and I'm like, yeah, that's me. There is, there is something to do with love in terms of how and why my devices are so endearing to me. And it's not just that I'm in love with my devices, I'm in love with what they allow me to do. So, uh, and that's about, um, our technologies and enabling idol idolatry. So if, if the, if the deep love of our heart is relationship, well, then we'll link into social media. If it's success and power, we'll link into, you know, the share market or, or into productivity apps. You know, there's, there's lots of avenues through which we can express our idolatry, but it's all through one device. And I think that's very similar for Christians. Yes. Uh, and pastorally in pastoral ministry, you see ministers, on the technology all the time because it's the link with everyone else. Mm. Yet, uh, perhaps even 50 years ago, uh, the time of solitude in your study was important in ministry, but it doesn't seem to happen as much these days. Well, absolutely. And I, I find it so hard. I've just gone on five weeks of silent retreat, which is a bit ridiculous. I've never done it. It was part of my long service leave. But I just found that the first few weeks were really hard. And then by the end of it, it's like my soul caught up with my body. And I was like, it sounds a bit, you know, new age, but it was, it was almost like I felt like my inner life had connected with my outer life again and the ability to just enjoy things. Like I could just, I remember just sitting and watching a eucalypt just sway in the breeze for like 20 minutes and it felt like no time at all. And it was just peaceful and mm. a sense where I could worship God in my spirit. So I, I think we can just lose the beauty in the simple everyday things because we're so stimulated with man's idea of what we need. And yeah. we, can't, we can't escape the digital world. The, the book is definitely not an anti-tech book. I mean, I work in the tech industry in the sense of working with leaders and training them in tech habits. But I do think we need to reclaim what it means to sit in silence and solitude, to think our own thoughts and not someone else's thoughts, yeah. uh, and to relate with people away from a device without being mediated through a screen. <laughs> like you and I are right now. Yeah, that's right. It gives and takes away. Now, here's a question. Gives and takes. Yeah, it's holiday time coming up. You've had your sabbatical, but some of us are going to try and take a break over <laughs> Christmas. Yeah. The temptation to be on your phone during your holidays when you're away on a beachside resort somewhere or just chilling out southwest of Western Australia, which is like, a, it feels like even in your holiday break, uh, what effort does it take to say we are going to switch our phones off for three or four days on our holidays? It just seems almost beyond us, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, again, this is my argument is that we need firstly to change our paradigm. We actually need to see uh, why and how our relationship with the online world works. Cause if we can't see ourselves, we can't change. I mean, that's a biblical principle. You need a metanoia. You need a change of mind to be able to change your beliefs and behaviors. Uh, so we need to see that. Um, but yeah, I mean, very practically, look, it, I think it, it's something that you need to build up over time. I mean, you can go cold Turkey and I think it's fine. If you're on holidays, delete Gmail or the mail app from your phone yeah. and go without email. I mean, just to delete it is quite a scary idea. Get rid of social media apps from your phone. If you're going away. Um, I have a weekly Sabbath, which means I detox from technology every week from Friday night to Saturday night. I have no tech, no phone. So that has been a practice that has been a total game changer for me and my family. And that's described in the book. But um, if you're on holidays, practice that. Just turn it off for half a day and see what happens and, yeah. and, and build in the practices. Well, and if, I, yeah. if you get tugged here, <laughs> it may be that 
it may be that there are some loves and longings that are misplaced yeah. if you actually can't disconnect from your phone for half a day without getting sweats. Yeah, that's a very Augustinian way of thinking about it too, because there's, there's the chapter of sign rest. And what, I, what I'd say is, as I look through it, you've got a little uh, hints and uh, life hacks to be able to do it. Assigning rest in your life. Don't we live in the age of authenticity where we go, oh, I just am spontaneous and rest just happens. But you're saying, I want you to discipline your life enough to assign rest to it. Yeah, I think deep rest, like there's a lot about deep work at the moment because of Cal Newport stuff. Um, I think deep rest is even harder. I, I think we have totally lost our ability to rest deeply uh, and we need to return to the sabbatical principles actually, that what it means to, to, to be on Sabbath. Uh, but for that, it, it requires that we actually examine what is work for us and what is rest and, and how do I flip modes. And for me and for many of us, Work involves swiping a screen, typing, communicating online, um, you know, sw sw flipping between internet browsers. And therefore, neurologically, we need to take a break from that neurological pattern when we're on our days off. It doesn't matter whether you're watching Netflix or using Outlook, it's the same pattern. So I think we really need to examine what is work, what is rest, and to actually practice resting really deeply individually and with our families hmm. and, and that's possible and it's amazing when you can invest in that yeah and look didn't netflix say that the biggest rival was sleep or something like that <laughs> i haven't heard that but i think it's true, <laughs> it's true you know? and look it's interesting that on the back of the book you've got jack rewald who says you know read this book uh, rather than and don't read it on a digital uh, platform yep. <laughs> read, the, read the actual book uh, you've got people from faith and people from the world saying much the same thing about the book. Do you think there's a, a wisdom aspect that Christians can say lean into and say, I want to show you as Christians, we've got a rest that we can lean into that we want to show you as maybe the world. Uh, we can show you how to rest, but we're not doing it very well sometimes, I think. Absolutely. I think we have, I mean, of course I believe this. I'm a pastor as well as a productivity consultant, but Jesus offers us, the tools and the, the biblical wisdom shows us how to live. It's just, I think we've, we haven't really applied it very well theologically or practically as Christians. We have Sabbath, which is an amazing rich tradition if we could learn to do it well. And that uh, involves how we understand our use of technology. We have the principles of resting before we work. If you look at the pattern of the seventh day, and that applies to how we book our holidays before we book our work. It applies to why we might put in silence at the start and end of the day, rather than starting with, you know, our, our phone. Uh, there's all these practices that I'm seeing coming out in the, I suppose the, you might say secular realm that I'm like, they're just biblical practices and we haven't grasped them ourselves, but we have a much deeper theology and tradition to help us understand how we got there because uh, you need a change in the spirit. You, you need to be transformed through repentance and belief to actually be able to change your digital habits long term. So I, I think we can offer a lot. Um, it's not a religious book, mm. as you said, but um, my hope is that people will ask questions about their why and, I'll, and also you know, ask the question, maybe Christian faith has, has something to offer in this space as I try to examine my own beliefs and patterns. Yeah, well, you're up for a business uh, book of water from what I... What well, well I'm in the running. Let's see if we yeah. get it tonight. <laughs> That's great because it's obviously speaking a wisdom into the, wor into the world in a proverbial sort of way in that sense. Yeah. Okay, uh, some life hacks. First thing you do if you're the digital person who's just a digital native and you're hooked to that phone, what's the first thing you can do to break the cycle? I'll give you two things. One, I would charge my phone and all my devices individually and as a family outside of the bedroom mm -hmm. and learn to start the day with your own thoughts, some silence or reflection or just quiet and end the day with your own thoughts or maybe even talking to the person sleeping next to the bed with you, you know, like um, rather than starting and ending the day with what Donald Trump has said or, you know, yeah. et cetera, something about COVID. Uh, so that's my first life hack, really simple. Uh, second one, I would say turn off your phones and eat a meal together as a family or, you know, individually, or if you're single, eat with flatmates, etc. but eat without devices. And the research just in that alone is incredible. It improves the, um, the health, mental health, um, outcomes, it improves, um, uh, educational outcomes. It reduces debt, reduces alcoholism. Uh, it reduces 10 pregnancies you know, the simple habit of eating together. It's got nothing to do with the food you eat. It's just to do with relationship without mm. technology. Yeah. Two simple hacks. You could start with that. Um, 
and then turn off your phone a day a week and then really freak out. <laughs> <laughs> that would freak some people out. It feels like there's a space maker too to come to, to go to lean into that. Cause this feels like the start of a conversation. A lot of us haven't had. And uh, it's really encouraging. Uh, Daniel C, thank you very much for uh, speaking to us at uh, stephenmcalpine.com. If you're watching this on the day that you should have your technology off, shame on you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, I look forward to reading more about what you do across Christian and, uh, and secular space on this area. So thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks, Steve.